Hello adventurers and welcome back to the Legend of Kalamantura series, Settlements of Mentura. Um, I've already done videos previously on Terran and Brewstock, uh, where my party started, went their way through, Brewstock was where they had the Noel fight, met the new player and then carried on. Um, as things stand, the party, oh, excuse me, but you know, oof, uh, the party are in Steelborough, it's a dwarf mining colony. Colony. <laughs> the Dwarven Mining Colony. What? I cannot speak to the first cr grits, crips. <laughs> there we go. I can't say it again. First we had crits of grips. Now we have Dwarven Mining Colony. <laughs> oh, boys are dear. One of those days. Anyway. So, at time of recording, the party are <coughs> apologies headphone users so at time of recording the party uh they've arrived at Steelborough they've had a bit of an explore in the town bought some supplies gone to the infirmary gone to the moldy toe met some met some of the NPCs and they're ready to start their first dungeon delve uh, they've got a map and some people to escort them. So it shouldn't be too challenging, but we shall see. So Steelborough itself, uh, nestled between the splayed foothills of the Spine Mountain, the Spine Mountains, that's what I call the mountain range in the middle of Ventura, uh, lies the mining colony of Steelborough. The mine is one of the smallest populations in Ventura, um, but the heavily defended walls would suggest otherwise. In fact, Steelborough sits atop the richest known mithril deposit on Kelimantura, the planet, uh, which the council is extremely keen to protect. Now, slight sidebar, I'll get slight sidebar onto what mithril does in my campaign. Now, I don't know what mithril really does in D&D, 5th edition standard vanilla D&D. Um, it's like a lightweight... In my understanding, is mithril is like a lightweight, extremely lightweight, extremely strong metal, which is why you get, which is how you get like elven chainmail, for example, or elven chain shirt. Um, like chainmail, you need a strength requirement of like 15, 13 to wear it. Whereas if it's made from, if it's elven and therefore made of mithril, you don't have the strength requirement. That's my understanding of how it works in vanilla Dungeons and Dragons, fifth edition at least. Uh, my interpretation of Mithril is that it does that as well, is that, yeah, it's lightweight, it's a much tougher metal, it's a lightweight, stronger metal. But like adamantium or nth metal, these comic book metals that are, oh, it's super light and super strong, it's the best metal. On top of that, I've put that Mithril is used to create magical items, uh, from a giant of weapons and armor to arcane constructs. The reason being that Mithril is a magical sponge, uh, which is what makes it good, so good for enchanting. Um, now, again, this is my world, my interpretations, my theories, that you have, this is a prop, you have standard Yoli longsword made from, this is plastic, obviously, but if you have a normal longsword made from steel by a blacks, Smith, uh, yeah, you can go ahead, you can go ahead and take your standard longsword made by a blacksmith to an enchanter and go, hello, good sir, here is several thousand gold pieces, please make this a plus one, plus two, plus three longsword. Uh, what Mithril does is either when the sword is made or when it's being enchanted, the Mithril is incorporated into the sword so you take your standard sword sword <laughs> i've got that tabasco song stuck in my head i'm not gonna sing it but you know the one uh now i don't know if the camera picks this up but here in the middle of the blade there's the plastic is this kind of like uh like there's, there's a nice little design on it so if you took a long sword and you then up the middle of the blade, you sort of carved out some runes, you etched out some runic shapes or other enchantment type thingies. 
Oh, never mind. Uh, so yeah, you can then take, you can etch out, and then you put mithril into these etchings. And that will make the enchanting process easier because the mithril will more readily accept the enchantment than the standard material. I do... I want to create a table on that. So basically, in counter enchanting an item, the DC, the DC to enchant, or how difficult it is to enchant, depends on, one, the quality of the material... So, you find an old rusted longsword in the dungeon. Can you enchant it? Uh, yes, you can, but the strength of the enchantment is limited because the base, the, it's an old, crappy, rusted longsword. Uh, not the best quality material, so you're limited in what you can actually enchant it to. You can maybe limit it to a plus one. Uh, you salvage a used longsword off of a bandit's corpse. It's a very well used long, so it's been a while, it's dinged, it's pitted. You can see he's had it repaired a few times. That would be limited to a plus two, unless you went off and had it repaired. Whereas you buy a long sword out of a blacksmith, nice, very well made long sword, you can have a plus three enchantment on it. Now the difference being that oh, we give a quality of materials. Uh, now if you go ahead and get a sword, a long sword made, and you ask the blacksmith to put mithril into the metal, so you have your steel and you mix it with mithril, that's going to make it more difficult to forge because you are mixing different metals, different, different melting points you have to manage it. So as a blacksmith, that's more challenging to do. But the end result would be a sword that could be much more easily enchanted. Now, could you make it a sword entirely out of mithril? Probably. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I don't know enough about the material component, the material properties of Mithril. Um, it would be very, very lightweight. And depending on what you want to use it for, that's probably a that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, this is me talking about my theories of how weapons work. Now, you want to make something that's very lightweight. That you can move it, you can redirect it very quickly. It's very easy to move and use. And you're able to put more force behind it. But if you're going to use a cutting weapon. Now for scalpels, let's, let's take a, scal a scalpel. is something that's very lightweight and very, very, very sharp. But you, 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 a surgeon uses a scalpel when he's on a patient. The patient's lying unconscious on the table. And he just goes, and it cuts. If you're in combat, you're taking a sword, you're swinging it. And it hits the target. There needs to be... A good chunk of energy behind that to actually cut the target and do damage. So a longsword made entirely out of mithril, you need a bit of weight behind it to actually impart damage. Uh, or an axe or something like that. You need weight to do the damage. It's like making a hammer out of mithril. It's light, but it's very strong. A lightweight hammer, you can see where the balance in that comes in. Uh... So a mithril weapon, pure mithril, but very lightweight, something like a rapier or a dagger where it's doing piercing damage, that might be best because, yes, you're thrusting, but the blade's light and very fine points. You can see where my theory is going here. But essentially, mithril is part of the enchanting process. You can create components out of mithril that will just be a sponge for magic. Or you can have them etched onto weapons after the fact to make the enchanting process easier. Um, so that's where the balance point comes in. So the enchanting cost goes down because there's less man hours spent on it. But the material cost goes up because you're putting me through. So there's the balance point. Uh, now, like I said, so on Kelamantura, Mithril is using the creation. Yeah, so da -da -da. It's highly receptive to magical energy, so it can make the process of creating magical items much easier than it would otherwise be. However, it does come with a cost, quite literally. Uh, mithril is one of the most expensive materials due to its relative rarity, but high demand. So, yeah, this is why this is why Steelboro is so heavily defended, because it's the richest known deposit, richest known deposit on the globe. There are other mines that, are, that produce mithril, but Kelamantura is like, 
oh, that's a big mine. Yeah, this is very valuable stuff. So it's an asset the di- the repo- the council <laughs> want to protect. Got there in the end. That's why it's so heavily defended. And my access, as my party found out, is very strictly controlled. You can't just walk up to the gates and walk in. It's like, no, you've no business here. Bugger off, please. Um, as also came up with my players, the mine has changed hand several times over the years. Uh, the most recent, I said most recent, was during the purge, just after the purge, so 500 years ago. Uh, the mine was entrusted to the Steelbrow clan uh, as a reward for their efforts during the purge. Um, it was given to them by the council, but the mine was being held by a Duragar clan. You know, with D&D, the Durgar are kind of evilly, not very nice dwarves. So the Steelbrow took a couple of legions, and right, we're going to take the mine back. And the Durgar had held the mine for hundreds of years throughout most of the Purge. And during the eviction, <laughs> that's a bit of a light word there, so when evicting the Durgar from the mines, um... The Steel Brows found a hidden dig deep within the earth that contained the rich Mithril vein. So this Mithril vein was there, had been there for a long time. The Duragar, at some point when they uh, had been in charge, had found it. So, the, oh, this is this is really useful. We can use this, which is why they were so keen to hold on to it. Uh, unfortunately, the steel, well, for, unfortunately for the Duragar, the Steel Brow came in with a lot of men. And a bit of an axe to grind. And says, nah, you get out. <laughs> it's like, you five minutes to get out. Leave now. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the Steel Brows discovered this hidden mine. And went, that's Mithril. That's a lot of Mithril. And it's very good quality Mithril. Ooh, boy. So, that's why the Steel Brows... That's why the mine is so heavily defended. And it's also why the Steel Brows are stinking rich. Because they got given the keys, because they were given the keys, the richest methyl deposit that was known. Had the, had that methyl vein been known about before it had been handed over, who knows if Steelbrow would have ever been given the mine. You're not entirely sure at this point. Um, so at, at the moment, the Steelbrows run it. They've run it about 500 years, which for dwarves is two or three generations. So it's fairly, to them, it's not really a big deal. If you're human, this mine's been run for five, six, five... <laughs> for several generations by these dwarves. You have made a lot of money off the trade. Particularly since the war. Because once the war ended, uh, there was an agreement in the peace treaties to share, share technology, share materials. So suddenly... Uh, well, it was always uh, the Republic of Ambrino kind of always had a thing that was, oh yeah, we want this. Can we can we get some mithril, please? And then post war, there was a bit of an uptick in the demand for mithril because you suddenly had sharing of materials, sharing of technologies. So suddenly, the very non magic people in the dynasty suddenly were able to get access to. Enchanted weaponry, enchanted tools, enchanted materials to build their own stuff with. So suddenly, these people have access to enchanted materials. Which functions exactly the same way as a normal material. You get a chunk of steel, you build something out of it. It's now an enchanted item. Or it's an item that can be enchanted. So, that's how enchanting it's a very, very low-level overview. I do want to get deep into it, but my God, I do not have the time to do so. <laughs> I don't have the knowledge to do that either, but... Yeah, that's why Steel Burrow is so heavily protected and why it's a big deal and why the party were sent there in the first Because, yeah, we can't mine Mithril. That's a big deal. But yeah, that's Steel Burrow. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to do the next video of these. Of a few, I could, I could potentially do some of these halo towns and cities because, well, the party are... They've got a bit of a track at the moment of things, places they need to go. So I think I might just go off and do some of those and come back to the cities they're going to next, later on. 
Um, because what I don't really want. I want the party when they get to other cities. It's the first time they hear about it. Um, so we'll see. These this series might slow down, but we'll see. I might do some Halo stuff, or I might go off and explore the Republic of the Dynasty a bit more. But I hope you guys found this interesting. Because I certainly did. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And again, thanks for watching and thanks for the support. Um, so, adventures. Until next time, thank you very much. See ya.